Uh, Tim Elliott is talking about surface environmental changes, changes constraint rates of mantle stirring. Um, yeah, when I, I, I think I've left you guessing as to what I'm going to talk about because there's no abstract and a completely baffling title. And as I was looking at that title last night, I, um, I, I really thought it didn't tell us very much. What I was trying to allude to actually is what was mentioned earlier about this notion of earth system science, but in the grandest sense that it's not just bits of the surface that tie together, but it's the surface talks to the deep and there's a record of environmental change on the surface in stuff that's perhaps made it down to the core mantle boundary and back, which I think is pretty cool. However, I don't think the title did it very well and I, I subsequently thought, really, I should have entitled it this. <laughs> so the, what we're trying to do is uh, look at the fate of um, the tectonic plates. And so we know that the plates get subducted at about 20 kilometers cubed a year. That's a lot of material, and that's been going on for a long time. And they've got to go somewhere. And we'd like to know where they go. And geophysicists give us a few snapshots, which at best are a few hundred million years old. But this is a cycle that we want 100 million year or more time scale to see what happens. And so that's what geochemists do. We, we have less resolution at depth, but a, a better time control on things. And so the sort of game that we would play is look at the traces that we put on the plates as they get subducted. And so magmatic processes that, as you know, I love, um, produce the continental crust and en enrich a lot of elements in that. Surface environment removes certain of these elements into the oceans. And then alteration processes tag elements and isotopic signatures to the top of the altered oceanic crust. That makes it back down the chute. And what we're trying to do is look for some of the exotic uh, geochemical signatures that we impart on the surface that get taken to depth and are definitively from the surface. So when they return from the depth, we know they used to be at the surface and have returned. Um, so this is a cottage industry, and we've tried it with, with lots of different elements. And each, it's a bit like the uh, proxy confidence thing, and we all get very excited about it. Then we get depressed, and then there's a bit of realism. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about one that I guess maybe is still so nascent it's in the optimistic phase. Um, and, but I, I thought we should run through what it is that would make a, your, your ideal tracer. And so what you want is that it's highly incompatible, so it doesn't want to hang around in the mantle. It gets transferred to the melt and hence to the continent. So it's pre-enriched at the surface. Then it needs to be sufficiently fluid mobile that during erosive uh, weathering process, it, it gets transferred from this reservoir in the continents into the oceans. I'm an isotope geochemist, so you want some isotope action, and so you'd like it to be fractionated. And because of low temperatures at the surface, that should impart a signature that you don't get at depth. Um, you don't want to fritter it all the way at the subduction zone, so you want this thing to cling onto the plate as it gets subducted. And I would argue, and I hopefully persuade you, that uranium satisfies all of the above. Um, OK, this is a sort of picture of what uranium does in, in the oceanic crust. And I think it's, it's nicely visual in that this is the mafic oceanic crust, so where gallant sailors have gone out into the oceans and drilled uh, hundreds of meters of crust um, kilometers down. But you can see very clearly that the, the, the mafic oceanic crust has very little uranium. But the upper 500 meters or so is hugely enriched, up to a factor of 10, on average about a factor of 5. So that's a huge slug of uranium that is imparted ultimately from the continents via weathering and erosion and alteration into the oceanic crust, primed to go down the chute. And that's a lot of uranium that can do significant damage to the uranium budget of the mantle. OK, and this is what happens in the mantle. And so you can see this is, you know, I'm saying this is the optimistic phase. That's for the isotope bit. This is an old game that I've been peddling for about 20 years. And in fact, got ignored the first time around, so I've reinvented it so that people maybe take more notice of it this time. Anyway, so we're putting uranium down, and we want to compare it to something that behaves similarly in magmatic processes, but differently in alteration. And so we take its old chum thorium, you know, another heat producer at the top of the chart, the nuclides, 
And these are good because we know where the Earth started. They're refractory lithophiles, so none of it's in the core. All the meteorites have the same value. And the value of thorium uranium, so these are the nuclides, that's the ratio, and that's for the classically trained that they, we like to call these things Greek letters. So kappa of the Earth from meteorites is four. We know kappa, the thorium uranium ratio of melts from the upper mantle, is about 2.5. That's a big difference because these things do nothing during melting. So plausibly going from here to here is recycling this surface uranium that's in the upper oceanic crust back into the mantle. So I, I think that's a plausible first order observation. The nice thing and the reason we compare uranium to thorium is because these both have decay systems. So not only do we get the magnitude of the perturbation of uranium, but we get the timing of it. And so thorium goes, goes to lead 208, uranium 238 goes to lead 206, and these are compositions of bits of the mantle. Now, the earlier you have this change from high to low thorium uranium, the more you go from where you want to be over to the right. And in fact, the amazing thing is that the lead isotopes say that you can't have deviated from the uranium thorium ratio of the mantle too early in time, or you'd mess up your lead isotopes. And so you can play these games, and this is a pretty crude cartoon of it, but you can do it sort of with a wing and a prayer. You can just about get that dashed line in, and so you can start to decrease the uranium not much further back in time than about two billion years. Okay. Two billion years is a significant time for uranium because that's when the surface of the Earth became oxic. So I, I could show the surface of the Earth becoming oxic by pictures of detrital uraninites versus hydrothermal uranium deposits. I'm an isotope geochemist, so I showed as a big delta 33, uh, uh, which is an awful um, index, really, because what we the game here is you've got a lot of variation. You don't have a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere. You don't have any. You do. Anyway, so it's visual, though. And so what we can see from all these uh, glorious big delta 36 measurements is this variability ends around about 2 billion years. And this is the great oxidation event that I think many, most of you will be familiar with. Now, the important thing about the great oxidation event is it turns uranium from uranium-4, when you don't have much oxygen, to uranium-6. Uranium-4 behaves like thorium. It doesn't move during um, weathering. Uranium-6 hops into water at the first opportunity, waves bye-bye to the continents, and heads out to the oceans. And so there's this um, beautiful symmetry between the timing at which the thorium-uranium ratio of the mantle starts to decrease and surface processes and the timing of oxidation of the surface and the ability of uranium to start moving. And so to um, label a cartoon, this period where thorium uranium of the mantle doesn't shift is where uranium on the surface is as uranium-4. We oxidize the surface, uranium's free to go walk about and heads off into the mantle. Okay. So anyway, that's a 18-year-old story that was in fact longer because it took us so long to write up. However, in the meantime, we've had the revolution of plasma mass spectrometry, and now we can measure not only uranium concentrations, but we can measure their isotope ratios. We've been able to measure their isotope ratios, I should hasten to add, for quite a long time, but we assume they were constant. And if you didn't measure 137.88, you were wrong, and a guy from Caltech would phone you up and tell you you were wrong. Um, <laughs> however, We've now got much better at making these measurements to, to really high precision. And if you look at them to really high precision, you can start to see variations that are driven by processes on the Earth's surface where temperature's low enough to get these subtle variations. Um, oh, yeah, still forget that. And so what we want to do is look, we, we were hopeful, we didn't know that we might get some suitable isotopic variations to trace this process that we'd identify just from an elemental mass balance perspective. And, and this is it. And this is, this is a lot of hard work that was done by Morton Anderson. So this is the same transect through the Mafic Oceanic Crust, a different one. This is in the west of the Pacific, top 500 meters, which we know now is where all the uranium sits elementally. Um, 
This reference, and we'll sh I'll show you a bit more of this later, this is where we think the bulk Earth should come from chondritic meteorites. We believe uranium is well represented by the chondritic meteorites. Now, this alteration process isn't quite as simple as we'd like because I'll brush this under the carpet that goes isotopically light. This is isotopically heavy. This is isotopically heavy. The net effect of this, these are, these are not single measurements. These are measurements of blends of material that representatively sample this. We can't make lots of measurements because they take a long time. So instead, we blend material and make a few measurements. If each of these are blends of this, this, and this section of the crust, and this thing, the supercomposite, is, is the weighted average. And it is statistically significant. And so the, the weight of uranium is in this bottom part. And so the mean of the altered oceanic crust is isotopically heavy. OK, so this is the ratio of 238 to 235 uranium expressed in parts per thousand. You'll notice it's, it's not, there's not a lot of variation going on. So you have to measure these things to about a few tens of parts per million. Anyway, this was a result we were pleased about. The uranium that we believe is being recycled into the mantle, on average, is isotopically heavy. The mechanism that produces that, if in, just to, to give you a little more context, is partial reduction of the uranium. As the seawater flows through the oceanic crust, as it goes to depth, it gets reduced. As we know, uranium likes to move when it's oxidized, not when it's reduced. So when you reduce it, you sink it into the oceanic crust. If you don't do that quantitatively, you isotopically fractionate it, and you fractionate it to make it heavy. This stuff at the top is oxic absorption that counter, counterbalances this to some extent, but there's not enough of it. So the net effect is to recycle heavy uranium. I wish I'd have put that just as words rather than this complicated diagram, but this took a long time to make those measurements, and, and, and those are the data. OK, so then the thought experiment, if we were right originally that the uranium that we flush off the surface into the oceanic crust and pump into the mantle that decreases the thorium uranium, the upper mantle, as sampled by mid-ocean ridge basalts, should also be isotopically heavy. You know it will be, because I wouldn't say it otherwise. So, so again, a few data points, but actually quite a lot of measurements and a lot of work. This is an uh, average of meteorites, which are a real pain to measure because they've got almost no uranium in. Uh, these are ocean island basalts. This is our other flavor of the mantle that we maybe believe comes from deeper. And these two are the same. What is strikingly different are the samples of the mid-ocean ridge basalts that are distinctly isotopically heavier. They're not hugely, the, that's a total range of 50 ppm, but it's statistically significant. The thing that I think is potentially interesting for the future, that there may be derision from the audience, but I, you maybe can see that there's slight differences between the oceanic basins, which would be really interesting if that that held with more analyses and would tell you something about the planned form of mantle convection, if you could deal with it in a clever way. Um, OK, so that's always nice. You turn out to be right. OK, so however, th th that's, I don't think that's the full story. Because we'll go back to these ocean island basalts. This is the other flavor of the mantle that we believe comes from deep. Now. We've got two traces now of this recycling of uranium into the mantle. We started off by saying we go from a chondritic value to low thorium uranium by recycling elemental uranium. That elemental uranium that we re re recycle today is heavy, so we move them to heavy values. So, there's a, so we can explain more. Low thorium uranium, heavy 238, no problem. And, and that was the slide we had just now. What's a little more puzzling are the ocean island basalts. And they nicely go from near chondritic values, which makes sense. That's what the Earth started as. They go to lower thorium uranium ratio. We, they experience a bit of uranium recycling. But the uranium that's recycled in them isn't isotopically heavy. So what's going on here? And this is probably, so this is a game where I try and make the link to the surface, is that the oxidation of the surface occurred in kind of two jumps. It, so 
This graph is a plot of time against the uranium content of marine sediments, which is meant to be a proxy for the uranium content of the oceans. We see a little burp at about 2 billion years for this great oxidation event, where atmospheric oxygen went from sub 1% to a percent or so. We get a huge burp here, where at about 600 million years at the end of the near Proto Proterozoic, where we got massive oxidation up to near present day values. And the key thing there is at this point, we mobilize uranium on the surface and we can pump it out into the oceans. At this point, the oceans become oxic. At this point, over this period, the oceans are anoxic. So we can move the uranium from the continents to the oceans, but then they just get dumped because the oceans are anoxic. The uranium isn't free to cycle through the whole oceans until the oceans themselves become oxic. Now, we produce the heavy uranium isotopic signature by partial reduction. We can only partially reduce something that's oxidized. We can only have oxidized uranium in the oceans in the past 600 million years. So this signature in the mid-ocean ridge basalts of a heavy uranium is a signature of the uranium imparted to the oceanic crust, not since 2 billion years, but in the last 600 million years. And so what the surface is doing is providing us a timer to say the time at which we started recycling isotopically heavy uranium, which is a wonderful thing. And so this then gives us quantitative timing constraints on the time it takes to, to pollute the whole of the upper mantle with uranium. And it's of the order of, well, the whole of the upper mantle is currently polluted, so the mantle is completely stirred on a time scale of about 600 million years. Okay, that's the main point. The next one's a little more subtle and I'm gonna to have to rush, so hold on tight. Uh, okay, so with the, the other thing, the, the ocean island basalts we were talking about. So we produce the crust, the crust takes uranium down, and but then the crust itself maybe gets taken to the core mantle boundary. This has been a popular model since the early 80s. Um, and we believe that some of the ocean island basalts, things like Hawaii, bring some of this recycled crust that got stored at the bottom, heated up, popped up to the top, and, and it returned. Okay. Now, if we're right that we've been recycling uranium for 2 billion years, but it's only become isotopically heavy in the last 600 million years, from about 2 billion years to 600 million years, we were recycling uranium, stirring it into the upper mantle, making new crust, and returning that down. So in fact, the crust that occurs in ocean island basalts should get, the thorium uranium should get lower and lower the younger the crust is. So that's another thought experiment. And that tests not only my model, but our whole perception of what we have in ocean island basalts. Fortunately, there is a way of trying to get the time of ocean island basalts by subduction. So we hope that uranium hung on during subduction, but one thing we know doesn't hang on is lead. That gets lost. That pumps up uranium thorium to lead ratios. We like that because they're a chronometer. So it's, that starts the clock. And so the lead lost by subduction starts the clock. We have the lead clock that we then sample when it comes back to the top. So we have a lead chronometer of how long these things have stayed at the bottom of the oceans. People have proposed that again since the early 80s, but nobody's believed them because it's too good to be true. And, and people have instead explained ages can always be two things. They can be ages that we like as geologists, or they can be mixing things, which really anything can be a mixing thing, and it tells us nothing. Well, not quite nothing. Okay. So this is the money slide. This is the lead age that I told you conceptually how we do. And the lead ages of ocean island basalts range from about 2.5 billion to 1.6 billion. So you can think of that as about the time it takes for them to go from the surface to the deep, heat up, pop back up again. And it's anywhere from two and a half to 1.5 billion years. The thing that I found amazing, and you know, people say that, you know, that they were gobsmacked about things. I was gobsmacked about this. I re it's too good to be true. And so that the old ocean island basalts have thorium uranium unfractionated from the bulk earth. As the crustal material that makes up 
the ocean island basalts gets younger, the thorium uranium ratio in it gets lower because it's sampling mantle that's seen more uranium added to it. So I think the whole thing adds up. Okay, so to summarize, I'm an isotope geochemist, so I'd, I'd like to peddle the isotope. So we've measured some isotopes to high precision. And I'd say that actually gives a pretty good constraint on the mixing time of the upper mantle is about 600 million years, or it could be even faster, which to me was a surprise, although some geodynamicists tell me whatever. But it's an observation. It's not a model. Um, and the other thing is that ocean island basalts show this systematic decrease in thorium uranium ratio with their model age and which suggests systematic uranium cycles since the great oxidation event and times and that the time scales that we get from lead isotope uh, ages are correct of a billion to a billion and a half a billion and a half years to two billion years okay i'm sorry i've run over Okay, thanks, Tim. Time for a couple of questions. You baffled everybody. One over there, yeah. Hey, Tim. Um, when you say that you know uranium changes oxidation state, um, is the change in uranium oxidation state the same sort of stage where you'd expect a change in a carbon oxidation? And therefore, would would this also track the, the likelihood for more melt-inducing volatiles being subducted? Or are they at different redox states? So if it was in log FO2 relative to a, a buffer, are they even equatable? Do you know? I mean, I don't. But, but so you're talking in the mantle, right? Yeah, one, so, so, so the stuff that's put into the oceanic crust and then subducted. The, the, the problem is, that, so I'm really talking about the surface. Once you get that uranium into the mantle, it's... It is dominated by the ambient mantle redox buffer. I'm talking buffer. about the surface as well. I mean in the oceanic crust. Would there be a point where, as the uranium is being oxidized and you see in this fractionation, if it correlate, can you correlate it with anything else and link it to melting events, for example? Uh, I don't think you can obviously relate it to carbonate. You, the thing you might want to relate it to <laughs> is rhenium. Rhenium has an almost identical redox chemistry to uranium. But so in, in terms of our tick list of the dream tracer, rhenium almost makes it, but then its decay product is swamped by the mantle because rhenium decays to osmium and all the osmium's in the mantle, whereas uranium wins because all the uranium's in the crust. Yeah, one more, David. Hang on, wait, 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 for, wait for the microphone. Oh, the <laughs> there was a lot of model there as well, I have to admit. <laughs> you might have to buy yourself a ticket to reunion. It, it's, it's a tough world. <laughs> Okay, very good. I think that's all we've got time for, Tim. Thank you very much.